this is the uh, Micropulse Laser Technology in Glaucoma. In this afternoon's symposium, there will be three uh, talks. I will be the first uh, talking on the new um, uses of Micropulse Laser Technology in Glaucoma. And with me are two distinguished speakers from the United States and from Hong Kong. Um, Dr. Robert Chang, the assistant professor from Stanford University, and uh, Dr. Pim and Chan, an honorary assistant professor from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Laser treatment is still a uh, popular option. Despite or amidst all these technologies that we have now, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the uh, drug delivery systems in medical therapy and in the field of surgery. There are very, very new advances that we are encountering. But still, laser is an option that is easy and effective. It's safe and, and may have long-term control. And th among the transcleral lasers, there's an addition of this new micropulse transcleral cyclophototherapy. Some may call it cyclophotocoagulation, but our group calls it cyclophototherapy. And uh, we'll tell you later. In our experience, uh, we call it MP3 for short, this micropulse transcleral cyclophototherapy. Based on our decade of experience, um, the, this particular laser lowers IOP. And across different types or different spectrums of glaucoma, refractory glaucoma of any type, mild, moderate, severe, and uh, it can be combined with cataract surgery it is a good adjunctive therapy for a safer surgery and uh, in the future, a potential therapy for angle closure. I have here a video clip just to show you on how this particular laser treatment procedure is done. Let me run this. So you see, there is a customized probe that is applied transclerally. Uh, later on, you will see the uh, close-up details of the probe. There is a notch. The notch is applied on the limbus. And then the probe is moved from side to side in a sweeping motion. It's um, with slight indentation. You move it in a painting fashion. Let me just uh, repeat this video again. So there you go. And this is customized to treat and to target the ciliary body, particularly the pars plana. So you've known of the conventional lasers that targets a pars plicata. This particular treatment procedure is for pars plana. It is shown here. This is the uh, prototype probe that we use during our early work in this uh, particular laser. So the version one is a prototype. And uh, you may ask, why did you change the, uh, the probe to the version two? In our early experience, um, we had some difficulty sometimes in sliding the probe. Because once you have given the um, peribulbar, sometimes the conjunctiva becomes uh, swollen. So it has, uh, sometimes you will be stopped and, and be restricted by the concave nature of the prototype. That's the reason why uh, we, we had um, made it, redesigned it to be a little bit more convex than the first version. Just to tell you about how different the laser delivery is, so a micropulse uh, transcleral laser actually delivered energy in a uh, short repetitive pulses with rest periods in between. And this is advantageous because there will be time for the laser exposure and for the collateral tissue to, to rest and to cool down. And with this, we, uh, we believe that this gives rise to its non-distractive nature. In contrast, when you um, deliver a conventional continuous wave, you have a high intensity energy in a period of two seconds continuously. 
The, we, when we started working on this uh, technology in the beginning, as what we call uh, the bench part of our uh, study, what we did is to determine the heat generated by this probe, you know, because that will uh, tell us so how much uh, destruction of this is, whether this is cyclodestructive or whether this is um, working in some other forms and mechanisms. So we, in the first part of our work, we, we made an experiment. We fired the probe in a matte cardboard and, and through a thermographic camera captured the temperature generated by the probe. So the micropulse probe captured about 35 degrees centigrade uh, temperature. In contrast, we also tried to fire um, the conventional in a continuous wave fashion, and it could go to as high as 500 degrees centigrade. And after determining how much heat it generated, we, were, we moved on to doing animal work. We started to uh, treat, this is, this is a histopathologic picture of a porcinase. We treated with micropause and with the, the, round, the one on the right without any laser therapy. So as you can see, uh, the pars plicata, the structure, the architecture of the pars plicata remains the same. There may be some slight changes in the pars plana as what I have mentioned, this treatment is meant for the pars plana. So moving on, after the initial work, we um, went into determining the safety and the efficacy of this treatment. And um, we published in 2010 um, our work on refractory glaucoma. We treated 40 eyes of patients. And um, we managed to bring down the pressure to about 30%, at least 30% from baseline. These are all uh, refractory cases after, with all the medical treatment, non-responsive to the maximum treatment we did without surgery. And what is very interesting to note of is that uh, we didn't encounter any um, incidence of thysis nor hypotony during the course of about 18 months of follow-up. And we followed up this pilot study with a randomized comparison. This is a randomized exploratory comparison of refractory cases of glaucoma also. And in the same manner, um, it was also very safe and efficient. Um, this is just showing you the, this the setting that we use for the comparison. The setting for the conventional TCPC is uh, 1, 1, 5 to 2 was. This is the ordinary, usually the ordinary setting that we use when we perform conventional CPC with the G probe. And we delivered 60 to about 112 uh, per treatment. The micropulse setting, that we, this is a standard setting that we use. A 2 watt power with 100 seconds pulse envelope. And the laser is on for about 0 0.5 milliseconds. And it's off for about 1.1 milliseconds. And as I've mentioned, it is um, performed in a continuous painting fashion. This uh, study, we, we followed up the patients for 12 to 18 months. And um, we found out that although both of them reached about 45% reduction from baseline pressure, uh, comparing the complications that we had encountered, their prolonged hypotony in five treated eyes compared to zero hypotony in the micropulse treated group. So now that we have a um, baseline experience of how it works, then um, it was introduced, uh, I think it was last 2015 where it was introduced, and it, it's now being used by a number of eye surgeons in different centers worldwide. We are now, we moved forward our team headed by the inventor who is Professor, uh, Professor Paul Chu. We have moved forward and now we are trying to apply this treatment in early uh, cases of glaucoma. And, and, and also we are now trying to combine it with uh, cataract surgery, having experienced its safety and efficacy in the early years of uh, treatment. So this is just to show you, these are 
just early um, follow-ups, no? We treated 11 cases of POAG and PACG, mild to moderate cases, with an average of about 23 millimeters mercury um, intraocular pressure at the beginning. And after six months of follow-up, there was about 25% reduction uh, from baseline IOP of 17. The number of medicines reduced from 3.3 to 2.6. These patients are still on ongoing follow-up. And also, we had a chance of combining it to some cases of cataract surgery. Just to show you, this is a video clip of, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, this combined procedure. This patient had a femtosecond laser cataract surgery and on about two medicines. And as you can see, after the uh, femtosecond laser application, uh, we proceeded to the uh, micropulse laser application after the femto laser cataract. And then the conventional phacoemulsification follows suit. So far, uh, we started this last year, early 2017. We have treated five eyes, and uh, four of them, uh, on the average, the pressure is 20 on two to three medicines. And after about six months of follow-up, four eyes are now without drops. And, and one of them, uh, in the beginning, was using two types of medicines. It's now using one type of medicine. It is also a very useful adjunctive therapy uh, to make your uh, glaucoma surgery, surfer, uh, surgery safer. No? And um, here are some of the cases that we, the, the more difficult ones that we had done in the past. We had an eye syndrome that came to us with a pressure of 70. And we had instituted all the available uh, treatment measures from medicine to uh, oral therapy, to lasers, and still, the pressure remained 48. And after, uh, so we decided to do laser treatment through micropulse uh, cyclophototherapy, and after the treatment, the pressure went down to 10. And after a couple of weeks, about two to three weeks later, we performed a glaucoma, a definitive glaucoma filtering procedure for this patient, a tube surgery in the same manner as uh, what we had done also in the other two cases of PACG and POAG. And both had uh, responded very, um, very well. Vision improved and uh, pressure decreased and was uh, well controlled. So what we have seen now is that there are different uh, variations in different surgeons. So we tend to optimize the therapeutic effect by varying the duration of the treatment, the duty cycle, the power, and so in order to arrive at the most effective energy. And in the horizon, there is also this um, possibility of, of redesigning the probe, because there, there are certain difficulties sometimes, especially here in Asia. You have patients who have very small palpebral aperture, so it's very difficult. Sometimes the probe is too bulky for the eye of the patient, so uh, it will be best to, to have a customized probe, especially for small eyes, so to, to ease the application of the laser. And uh, Come second part of the year, in the second quarter, we will be uh, involved in a prospective randomized study on micropulse laser. We call it PRISM. And um, this will run in different centers in UK, in the US, and in Asia. And this is one exciting um, uh, part of our investigation regarding this laser. So in conclusion, while this, this particular technology is easy to use and this new treatment modalities is safe, but it must be used carefully because of its power and efficiency, it's also not, um, we have to be, to be uh, worried that there are also complications that can happen and we, we should use it properly, the technique properly. Thank you, <coughs> Dr. Aquino. We're 
quite lucky to have her at this symposium because she's you know, the, one of the first developers along with Paul Chu, so you're hearing it directly from the person who has the most and longest period of experience. Um, I work at Stanford and uh, I was one of the early people to adopt MicroPulse in our practice in the West Coast in California. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit to uh, discuss what is the main differences between doing continuous transcleral cyclodiode laser versus the micropulse laser. Because generally, when we think about lasers to begin with, they tend to start off with continuous amounts of energy to achieve an effect. And then as lasers, we understand them better, we're always trying to use less amount of energy but still try to gain the same effect. And hopefully less energy means uh, safer procedures. So you see that in cataract surgery when it used to be continuous energy and then we got into pulsed phacos. You see that laser therapies like ALT and then we got into SLT where you deliver less energy but hopefully you still maintain the same effect. So I think it's actually kind of natural to think about uh, using like a diode laser, try to maintain the same efficacy but hopefully with less energy then you have a better safety profile. What is that minimum level of energy to not induce thermal damage but still get the same effect? So that's kind of the perspective here as we talk about shifting from a traditional procedure that's been around for a long time to more of a newer procedure. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. Um, so I never thought I'd be saying this, but you know, as a glaucoma specialist, uh, it's quite an exciting time you know, to be a, a glaucoma specialist. And many residents are thinking, yeah, I want to go into glaucoma now. We have all these new options. We can do things safer. There's MIG surgeries. So actually, I want to take a minute just to ask you, raise your hand, how many of you do some sort of minimally invasive procedure that's not just filtering surgery, you know, SLT or diode laser? Does anybody do show of hands? Okay, so good. So there's still a majority of you that uh, haven't tried out all of these uh, new, for example, these devices that you see here, um, or maybe including Micropulse. And uh, this may be an opportunity to think about how you can implement some of these new tools if it's approved in your home country. Uh, in terms of uh, being in the USA and what I have had access to for treating glaucoma, we oftentimes talk about starting off with uh, trabeculoplasty or medicines, and then if uh, that's not working out, then maybe we'll do something that is not on the more right-hand spectrum like filtering surgery or diode laser. You know, diode laser has always been, you know, in the back of your mind as failed everything else, then we go to CPC diode laser. You know, did all the filtering surgeries, there's no more space to do any more surgery, so let's just do laser because we know that sometimes when you over-treat with uh, diode laser, you can get hypotony and, you know, we don't want that in glaucoma if possible. That's even harder than treating high pressure. So just as a review, you know, continuous wave transcleral diode laser uh, has been labeled sort of for refractory glaucoma, maybe the last resort procedure. Its mechanism is to uh, ablate or photocoagulate the cellular body, the place of aqueous production. So by decreasing production, uh, then you can lower the pressure. Although it's something that's quite hard to t titrate. You know, we don't really know how much you need to laser to get the effect that you wish. That's the hard part of glaucoma. You want to hit that magic number where they don't get worse, whatever that number is. Um, so we generally try to maybe not treat all the quadrants in order to not get hypotony. You try to titrate maybe to an audible pop, so you, you do have some kind of endpoint feedback. Uh, and and th this is a bit of painful procedure, so you need some kind of uh, peribulbar anesthesia. Uh, you can see here there's actually two kinds of probes now that Iridex creates. Uh, one is the traditional G-probe, and then there's something called G-probe Illuminate, uh, which is attaching a, a light source, kind of like having a light pipe, so that when you transilluminate through the sclera, you can see the shadow of the ciliary body a little bit better. And this may actually help you, um, you know, get more effective uh, diode laser because you'll be hitting it in the right spot. Because as you know, the limbus can be variable, especially if there's panis. Uh, the, if you do a lot of UBM, you know, the, where the ciliary body sits might not be exact same in every eye. So. Uh, if your probe is not in the right spot, then you may be delivering sort of a variable kind of treatment. So there is a new, new probe that helps be a little bit more standardized. 
Now, when it comes to MicroPulse, which is uh, often abbreviated as MP3 uh, for, because of the MP3 probe, this is something that I tend to place it as like an alternative to incisional surgery, because obviously we have the division of things that you uh, do is procedure that involves cutting on the eye, which is MIGS and filtering surgery, and then there's maybe uh, the laser category of procedures where it's delivering energy into the eye, um, but not making any cuts on the eye. And a lot of you are going to have questions like, you know, how does this laser actually work? If it's not ablating the ciliary body in the same way, what's actually going on? So I'll try to address that. Um, and then what, how do you do the treatment uh, modality? Is it since it's not looking for some kind of audible pop, you know, how do you know when, when you're getting an effective treatment? And that's a little bit of a challenge because uh, there isn't something that's very obvious. And then uh, how do you actually do the treatment, which you saw some videos, but I'll also kind of reinforce that because that plays into the role of how safe the procedure can be. And in general, I still actually do this under uh, peribulbar anesthesia uh, just to make sure that it's uh, comfortable for everyone. Uh, so this was already mentioned, you know, what, what's the technology behind micropulsing something? It's uh, easiest to use the analogy of doing continuous energy FACO or then doing a pulse mode of FACO. So you're still delivering the energy but in uh, short intervals so that you don't allow the thermal buildup, uh, you know, to have, let's say, neighboring damage or coagulation of tissue. Uh, and, and yet you may still get the stimulatory effect or a change uh, either biochemically or with the anatomy in order to, let's say, uh, increase outflow potentially. So when you look at the histopathology, this is just another study that was done in the US uh, comparing what a control eye would look like uh, in picture of the ciliary body, and you can see the control on the top, no changes. Then some people happen to do low burn uh, transcleral diode laser to try to still get an effect of uh, uh, ablating the ciliary body without getting as much potential side effects. And then when you look at the micropulse version uh, in the same region, uh, you don't really see that much change. Maybe there are some small uh, pigmentary change, but it, it's uh, really not nothing to see on both videos as well as um, you know, in real time with uh, endoscope or on histopathology. But of course, it's very obvious when you do transscleral diode. You know, if you've ever seen those videos where they show the endoscope while delivering the laser, you see this huge explosion. The, the pops th that you actually see is, is almost like a bomb going off in the cellular body, <laughs> very destructive. And then obviously a lot of tissue necrosis uh, on histopathology, you know, highlighted in yellow there. So uh, to get better to try to answer the question about how it works. This is a video here that comes from an uh, ex vivo model of the eye uh, administering laser. And to, just to get you oriented here, uh, at the top half, what you're looking at is the ciliary body. And at the bottom, you're looking at the laser probe. And then the white band in the middle is, is transclerally, so you're through the sclera. Uh, so this is outside the eye, of course, um, because we're, we're showing a model eye. And you can see that when the laser energy is delivered, there's like a tiny little contraction in the ciliary body. So some people have been equating that to, let's say, maybe pilocarpine, how uh, a small change, a contraction in the ciliary body can increase outflow. And so that might be one of the proposed mechanisms of how uh, this uh, laser works. Uh, we already had this paper from Dr. Aquino talking about the first uh, randomized controlled study showing a similar IOP reduction in patients who underwent micropulse versus who went the transcleral dialed laser, but in fact, uh, no hypotony, which is, you know, something that I think is, is a big difference. Now, you know, for a procedure that was always relegated to the end stage, well, if you don't really have you know, those kinds of hypotony side effects, maybe you can move it to an earlier stage, or maybe there's a situation where someone didn't really want to have surgery, but they need some kind of laser, but they have pretty good vision without much, you know, field defect or anything, and like, you know, they absolutely don't want to have surgery, what is there to do? Something like this might fit in that situation of doing a micropulse laser. Uh, so I think what's happening is as we uh, get to this Offerings of more options in a disease that's chronic, sort of, you know, not reversible, yet you don't want to do something that prevents you from doing something further if you need it because it's not curable yet, uh, then you need to have a lot of different options. So 
Let's say they've already failed the traditional G-probe laser. Well, I'll tell a patient, let's try a micropulse laser because it may have a different mechanism of action and may work better for this situation because uh, you've tried other options already. Or you could always still use it first if you're hesitant in the worst cases. You know, that's the original studies. They took NVG patients where the pressures were like almost 50 and they showed a reduction about 30 to 40 percent in some cases that lasted at least uh, 18 months from Paul Chu's study. So that was really you know, how we test any new technology first, even tube shunt surgery. What did they do first? They only did it uh, in end stage eyes and then they found, okay, you know, after TVT study, they do primary TVT. Okay, now you can even start doing it in earlier stage eyes. So I think there's also that natural flow f as a new person adopting a new technology where you may try it in earlier disease if you're not getting any bad side effects. Um, and certainly someone who doesn't want to have incisional surgery or it's too risky, you know. And then maybe a lot of people who are also placing it more in the terms of MIGS concept, uh, you know, trying to get people off medication, of you know, um, trying to do something that's minimally invasive. And the key question always is, you know, what's the duration of effect? If, if you're treating less, it may wear off faster, just like the concept of SLT. You may need to retreat because it doesn't last a long time. There's some remodeling that always occurs in our drainage system. A one-time treatment generally doesn't cure things for life because of it's a dynamic system, you know, in terms of how that, the drainage system works. Uh, so. There's going to be a lot more data coming out uh, from different groups looking at duration of effect and how many retreatments you need and things like that. It's just something that we need to study. Uh, lastly, I kind of want to highlight what are the main differences between the probe, because if you're thinking about trying out this procedure, uh, it's, it's a little bit confusing at first, actually, on how the probe gets oriented, because uh, unfortunately, the notch, which is, you can see in high view, resolution view there, is it's kind of a little divot, and then the other side is, is flat. But that divot, because it's not highlighted in any color, the whole thing is one continuous clear color, it's sometimes kind of hard to see. Um, so I train my fellows to always remember flat side toward the lid, because the flat side is going to be what holds the eyelid back or hold it open, because actually in the technique that I often uh, teach to do, we don't use an eyelid speculum, because this is a sliding, sweeping procedure, and I don't want the probe to kind of bump along the uh, two parts of the speculum. And so to, uh, if you rotate the eye properly, especially if it's a small, deep set eye and you need to get good access, sometimes I use a muscle hook for that, you could use forceps, et cetera, then you can do your sweeping motion uh, quite easily without bumping into anything. And the other tip that I often give is uh, I like to use lidocaine jelly, uh, partly for the anesthetic purpose, but partly also because it's a great lubricant to not kind of snag along uh, the conjunctiva, because some people have conjunctival chalasis or you know, they have tube shunt or something in the way, and, you, and you, there's a little point on the tip there, and you don't want to you know, try to avoid getting subconj hemorrhage and things like that, but unfortunately you can't always. And uh, this allows it to slide very smoothly, and in fact, maybe even makes better conductance for the laser. So in terms of orienting, uh, because you know, obviously it's maybe hard to remember right now for when you do your first case, and generally you need to, you know, right at the time you're going to do one, remind yourself, oh, how is it oriented again? Flat side toward the lid. So flat side toward the lid. And um, the other key thing is to make sure that you're far enough from limbus, because obviously if you have a very proptotic eye, it's quite easy to do the sweeping motion. But then you know, a lot of eyes, small fissure, you know. Uh, tight lids, um, it becomes a little bit harder to do that nice uh, uh, sweeping motion to get a whole hemisphere. And so um, it's not too hard though. I mean, with practice, you can get it quite easily, but you just kind of have to remember what the ideal orientation is. So the ideal orientation is to not be too perpendicular and not too flat, right? Everything's got to be just right in glaucoma. So the reason why not to be too flat is that's probably the worst scenario is because you could be hitting the laser energy towards the iris root. Or uh, even if you uh, hit the iris, you know, maybe that's why a lot of people talk about medriasis or dilation of the pupil as one of the potential early post-op side effects. And, and this may be the mechanism because you're either too anterior, because you don't know where the limbus actually is due to panis or some other problem, or uh, because you're too flat, uh, because you know, the eye is not rotated in primary position perfectly. Um, so 
make sure you're not too flat. And then too steep, maybe you're directing too posterior into sclera and you're not even getting into the drainage flow area because you have to sort of be near the inflow outflow region. So the ideal position is about one to two millimeters posterior to limbus, nice sweeping motion perpendicular to the square, sclera. Uh, so this is just here uh, animation representing uh, the speed and, and how you have to adjust slowly. So generally when you're first starting out, um, we have you do it without applying the laser. So my fellows will actually do that exact sweeping motion, make sure it's quite easy for them to adjust the wrist all the way around, getting the, the motion right. It's kind of timed with the metronome, so you know that, that kind of high-pitched sound that you hear like that. So you get that going nice and smooth on the hemisphere. And you can treat one hemisphere, then treat the other one. And then some people do double treatments. I tend to do double treatments sometimes just to, uh, if it's a very high pressure, and I'm not sure if they were in the right position, so that going it over a second time will help. Uh, and then just as a reminder, notch towards the limbus, flat slide toward the eyelid. Okay. So this is the last slide, just, um, just to get you guys thinking, because you know, traditionally, everyone is very experienced with filtering surgery, with doing cyclodiode laser. Um, there's now something new that may be, you know, perfect for the armamentarium of stopping or slowing disease and glaucoma. Because as we know, there's not, even for the gold standard procedures, there's not one thing that just works indefinitely. Um, so having something else to offer always helps in glaucoma, especially if it doesn't cause any harm. Um, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, just some local experience and uh, some for some of our early cases and I have to thank my colleagues for uh, sorting out all the data for me. Uh, we at the very early days we had 34 eyes of 32 patients who underwent um, micro pulse uh, laser during the, uh, the year 2016 and uh, to 2017 um, at the age of around 66. Um, we have a variety of cases at the time. Uh, most of them were open angle glaucoma, and you also have, we also have some difficult cases such as neovascular glaucoma and also aphagic glaucoma. Most of them were pseudophagic, and as uh, for any of the early stage, uh, early, uh, well, we, we have a lack of experience uh, at the time, so we, we tried on patients who are having very advanced glaucoma. As you can see, the mean uh, intraocular pressure were uh, 30 at the time for most of these patients who underwent multiple uh, surgeries uh, with uh, some of them with very poor visual acuity and also almost a majority of them having um, on oral diamox and maximum medication. So these are very poor control intraocular pressure. And uh, these are just some of the results. Uh, as you can see, there's a dramatic drop of the pressure after the, uh, the micropulse laser. Uh, and that sustain uh, for uh, another six months, um, and also uh, sustain until now, actually, and also a reduction in the uh, use of medications. Perhaps it doesn't look all that impressive, um, but uh, at the time, because uh, you see the, the, the drop is not as dramatic as you might hope it would be, but uh, uh, as a last resort, uh, that was actually quite good. Um, so far, we have uh, followed them up to up to almost a year, and the success rate has been 82 per, 82 percent. If you consider success rate as success as uh, more than 30 percent reduction from preoperative intraocular pressure or a, a less than 22 millimeters mercury, um, although six of them we required uh, a repeated laser uh, within the first four months, but they end up uh, uh, having a, a fairly good uh, control um, up till now. Well, our cohort, as I said, uh, these particular cohort were the, were the, were the patients that done in the very early days. The, the pressure are very poorly controlled. They are very advanced glaucoma. Um, they have multiple surgeries before the micropulse, and there were lots of medications. So difficult cases, still worthwhile to do the micropulse, and it was working quite well. Um, and the second bit of this talk, uh, which is going to be quite short, is uh, I would just like to demonstrate to you how I use uh, micro pulse laser uh, for one of these difficult cases. Now, this is our, this, our patient is an 80-year-old uh, female with history of diabetes and hypertension. Uh, she had bilateral rectal detachment with encircling band done on both eyes, and 
the right eye was left aphakic. Eventually, she had um, aphakic glaucoma and also on three topical medications. And the time, the pressure was still maintained. Now, on the left side, uh, she has a macular scar. So, although on paper, the left eye was um, the better seeing eye, but uh, she relied on her right eye for the central vision. And as you can see, the cup disc ratio is uh, pretty enlarged uh, and is a quite advanced uh, glaucoma. It's 0.95 on the right side and 0.8 for the left. And uh, so the problem comes about mostly on the right side. So this is basically what happened. The patient has an encircling band done uh, for the right eye 20 years ago. Uh, because of the aphakia, she has uh, corneal decompensation and eventually bullous keratopathy. Um, she did a penetrating keratoplasty, uh, failed, and then she did it again uh, with uh, the sclerofixation intraocular lens uh, for the bullous K. Uh, then she also has steroid-induced glaucoma on maximum medication, including oral diamox, but she can't really tolerate the oral diamox all the time. And the pressure fluctuates around 20 to 40. Uh, we did, um, did G-PROP for her. didn't quite work. She also had uh, myopic maculopathy. And, uh, well, you thought that there's enough surgery for the, for the globe. But then she also had um, basal cell carcinoma for the right lower lid. So she ended up needing the excision and the tensile flap. So the, the, the eye was pretty small. It was a very small pulmonary fissure. Uh, we, we tried to do something uh, when the pressure wasn't too uh, unstable, but uh, she said, well, you know, can I just take a break from all this surgery? So we, we left, we leave it um, for, for a while, but then um, two years ago, her pressure became became uh, uncontrolled. It fluctuated between 29 to 37, the spike on ASOP and Genfort, and also on oral diamox. So uh, I, I did um, um, an armored valve insertion for her. Uh, during the operation, the conjunctiva was very tight, a lot of scarring. The tube valve uh, has to be placed on top of the encircling band. That's extensive um, uh, uh, peripheral anterior sinechi. Uh, so I put the tube in the, in the, in the sulcus and also the conjunctiva was closed uh, with, with some difficulties, with a lot of difficulties, actually. Eventually, uh, the surgery was okay, but well, it's not okay because it ended up with hypotony, with leakage. And uh, we, tried answer, we, we tried bandage contact lens, we tried multiple conjunctival repair, even with amniotic membrane, it didn't work. So eventually, we have to remove the tube uh, and cover the tube hole with scleral patch graft, and the pressure come, came back up again. Uh, 24 to 36, despite a maximally tolerated medication. So eventually, uh, we went for a micropulse. And um, uh, fortunately, it works uh, for uh, more than a year now. Now, visual acuity is not so impressive. Um, you know, understandably, after all these procedures, there, there got to be some damage to the optic nerve. Uh, but the pressure was maintained at about 14 to 16. Uh, she's uh, not seen so well, but you know, it's, it's sort of functional on three medications, um, and the important thing is the cornea graph is still clear um, despite using the micropulse. I would have imagined that uh, the cornea graph might, might get into some problem if, she, uh, if we did a G-probe for her. So uh, just to sum up what, what happened to this patient, uh, encircling band, two penetrating keratoplasty, a scale fixation intraocular lens, G-probe, lower lid surgery with tensile flap, glaucoma drainage device, done multiple leakage, conjunctival repair, and then we removed the, the, the G-probe, and then scleral patch graft. So we, are, we were hand tight. There's nothing else we can do apart from a micropulse. Um, so, so much so, uh, Robert uh, talked about um, filling up the gaps of, of, of uh, for filling up options of, of glaucoma surgery. Uh, perhaps now we can move along to do uh, micropulse for some earlier cases. Um, and to do that, I think uh, the ideal situation is to have an effective and significantly, uh, is, is for the procedure to be effective and significantly lower the eye pressure. It gives the physician control of the therapy of the compliance, and also uh, the procedure has to be efficient, repeatable, and leave future options open uh, for, for further procedure. Um, I think micropulse uh, gives up the options, and, uh, and I think micropulse uh, also give up the options uh, sometimes as a last resort of, of treatment of some of the uh, very difficult cases. <laughs>